All right, welcome to part two of our interview with Professor Richard Wolf. Okay. So that that's just this, these ideas are not going to get out in the establishment press, right? Because not in the establishment press, but in programs like yours that are open to them. The program we try to do, economic update, the, the talks I give around the country. I'm here in L.A. on the way to do that. Uh, I've never seen audiences as large as this. And even more, the quality, the enthusiasm, the excitement. It's as if, I don't want to push this metaphor, it's as if America's kind of waking up mm -hmm. after a long period of sleepiness. Mm -hmm. um, they're waking up, wow, and they're realizing we got a lot of history to catch up on. We haven't been paying attention. And as we look, our temperature is rising as we realize we got big things to change to make a decent society out of this. We can do it if those who understand it get together and move. Yes, and uh, we, the American public w has been put to sleep, and it was put to sleep by the dulcet tones of Barack Obama's speeches because uh, he really papered over a lot of the problems in America because we thought he was in control and he's going to do the right thing as he opened the Arctic to drilling twice, right. when he made the banks bigger, when he took us from two wars to seven, when he gave a health care plan that was nothing but a giveaway to the health insurance pro with no cost controls. So it was his speeches and his niceness that papered over that. And now Donald, Donald Trump is president and that's all gone. So that pretty face has been ripped off the horrible stuff that our system has been producing since I got to go back to 1980. So uh, because worker productivity and their participation in the profits have been decoupled since I would say right around 1980. I could that's be right. wrong on that number. No, that's what the numbers say. Okay. That's exactly what the numbers so say. You're, and you're, you say that Marx would prescribe worker co-ops. Now tell me about Lalo Cooperative in Buenos Aires. I don't know about Lalo Cooperative in Buenos Isn't Aires. Isn't that a restaurant in uh, Buenos Aires that was taken over by uh, the workers? You don't know about that? I don't know about that particular. I can give you examples of lots of other worker so, co-ops. Yes. But I don't know about that particular one. So tell us, uh, there, there's, a, there's in Italy and Spain. For In Spain, has yes. the, it has the biggest worker co-op. Right. right. Over 100,000 people are That's employed. Right. And that was started when? Okay. It's called the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. It was started in 1956 by a Catholic priest in that part of Spain. It's the northern part of Spain, the Pyrenees Mountains that separate Spain from France. And this Catholic priest gave a very famous talk in 1956 in which he said to the very poor parishioners in his church, if we wait for a capitalist, an employer, to come in here and give us jobs, we'll all die of old age before that happens. Ha, 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 everybody laughed. But the punchline was serious. If we're going to have work and jobs and incomes, we're going to have to do it for ourselves. And so he set up a worker co-op, sort of under the protection of the Roman Catholic Church in that part of the world because that's the dominant mm -hmm. church there, but also in what's called the Basque country. That's a, a separate group of people. They have their own language, their own culture. They're part of Spain, but they're really a, a unique people. B-A-S-Q-U-E, Basque. Right, Basque, B-A-S-Q-U-E, that's right. Uh, some of them live in the Spanish side of the Pyrenees and some live on the French side. They, they straddle the mountains there. They're kind of mountain people. Um, well, fast forward to the present. Over 100,000. They, they've grown spectacularly over the last 60 years. The envy of any capitalist corporation to have grown. During that time, they competed with many other capitalist uh, companies, even though they weren't capitalist. They didn't have a board of directors elected by shareholders, nothing of the sort. All that the Mondragon Corporation is is a collection of about 200 worker co-ops, some in manufacturing, some in services, some in agriculture, all kinds of things, united under one corporate umbrella. Today, the Mondragon Corporation, Cooperative Corporation is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. A fantastic success story. Let me give you a couple of the images or aspects of it. One, they have regular worker assemblies where the workers together get together to evaluate the supervisors and to determine whether they will keep their jobs. Let me drive that home to Americans. It's not the supervisor who hires you. It's you who hire the supervisor because the supervisor has to 
behave appropriately with the workers and they want to say in all of that. I'll give you another example. They have a decision made altogether that the highest paid member of the Mondragon company cannot make more than eight and a half times what the lowest paid worker does. In this country, the gap between the highest paid CEO and an average worker is in the order of 300 to 1. So if you want to do something about inequality, they've shown us how to do that. You get together and you make an agreement. We're not going to have an extreme inequality in our society. And guess what? When those people got together and they made that decision, that decision has stuck. And if you go to that part of the country in Spain, you'll see it right away. In the Mondragon case... They have their own laboratories where they do advanced research because they're a big corporation. And they're particularly good at electric cars and certain other things. So two American corporations uh, have so been taken with the quality of the work that they do that they asked if they could put their own scientists into the labs there in northern Spain to work alongside their scientists really? to pick up on the technology. That's something that's fairly often done. I thought your listeners might like to know the wow. names of the two companies. Micro love to. Microsoft and General Motors. Okay, So Americans may not know about worker co-ops, how efficient they are, how they've grown, their technology and their achievements, but big American capitalists have figured it out. Now let me give you the second example. It comes from Italy. And there are more worker co-ops in Italy than there are in almost any other country of Europe. And there's a number of interesting reasons that I think will interest your folks. The first example I'll give is the province or the, the, the area called Emilia-Romagna. It's a big part of Italy. 40% uh, of their economy is worker co-ops. They have developed worker co-ops so that in that part of Italy, every working person has freedom of choice. A young man or woman graduating from school can decide whether they want to work in a top-down hierarchical capitalist enterprise or – if they would prefer to work in a democratic enterprise where they have one person, one vote, and they would have that the minute they start working there. You could likewise in that part of the world decide whether you want to vote with your dollar to buy something from a worker co-op because you want to support that kind of business ver versus spending your buck in a regular capitalist enterprise. You know how we look at the label of a shirt, see where it's made? Right. Well, now in Italy you have a label of a shirt that says – made by a worker co-op or not, and that becomes something people are interested in. I think in both those examples, you can see that worker co-ops are viable, have existed for a long time, are able very nicely to compete with capitalist enterprises, and often win. And the lesson here, I think, is one that Americans will understand. If the worker is part of what owns and operates and makes the decisions— your attitude towards your work, towards the place where you work, towards the machines where you work, is different. They're yours. Of course you're going to turn off the light on your way out. Of course you're going to economize on the water in the bathroom. Because it's you and all the others like you that stand to gain or lose by your behavior. And you're going to get efficiency and commitment from your workers that you never see in a capitalist enterprise. And that's why, even when you think in terms of efficiency... What Marx's idea was, the workers getting together and running it democratically, has more than a little to say for itself. Can you tell us, what is it, the Macora rule in Italy? Yes, the Macora law. It's a wonderful law. In Italy, passed in 1985, showing you how powerful co-ops already were then. Here's what the law says. If you become unemployed in Italy, uh, you have two choices of what to do. Whereas here in America, we have one. The first choice is like the American one. You can go on what they call the dole. You go and you get a check every week for a year or two to see you through what we call unemployment insurance here. They have that in Italy too. But now comes what they have in Italy because of the Macora law that they don't have in the United States. You can make a different choice. You can choose to have the entire sum of money that the government would have given you over a year or two in weekly installments given to you as a lump sum right now. Here's what happens. Here's the rule. You have to get at least nine other unemployed Italian workers to make the same decision. That is to, to say we want the lump sum right now rather than collect it every week. And here's the second big one. You have to use that lump sum as the startup capital 
for a worker co-op. And the rationale for doing that was the following. We want the worker co-op sector in our economy so Italian people can see how it works, so they can make up their minds in an informed way what kind of economy they want. Number two, we believe that workers who are able to continue working together with others on a business that's theirs is a much better way to treat unemployment than to have people go every week and collect the check, feel bad about themselves, feel losing their connections with their employer, with their fellow workers, with the skills they once had. Much better to have the, – the Italians have done it. Big business in Italy has tried to undo it several times since then, have failed. It's still on the books. Oh, really? Yes. And the interesting thing for me as an American is I have never heard an American politician say a word about this. No. Never ask, gee, might some version of this be relevant to America? Should we try it? Should we see if it works here? I mean, it is this American notion that somehow we don't have to pay attention to anything. We're the greatest there right. is, and everybody else is a piker by comparison. We don't have to worry about it. It's, it's a terrible mistake that we lose from. So uh, do you have any statistics on uh, – I remember Nancy Pelosi being asked at a town hall meeting yes. by a millennial, uh, and he was saying that a lot of the young kids are into socialism, and she just dismissed it and said we're capitalists and that's that. Do you know uh, – has there been research done on the uh, popularity of what people consider socialism with uh, millennials and young people? Yes. The most popular one that's referred to these days is a study in 2016 at Harvard, which did a big, long poll and followed up with other polls. They did many polls because they couldn't believe their initial polls. Their initial polls indicated – that something on the order, of, depending on which one you read, something on the order of 40% of young people in the United States prefer socialism to capitalism. And that over 50%, I think it was 51%, don't like capitalism and are a little hedgy about saying socialism, but they don't want capitalism. I think the numbers are stunning. I think they do tell us of that a sea shift. But I think it's also... And I don't mean to demean these folks at all, but I think we have to face the fact that for 50 years in this country, we haven't had an intelligent conversation about capitalism and socialism, the pluses and minuses of both of them. We haven't had. That's an adult conversation. We have instead had their bad, 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 bad. We're good, 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 good. This is childish stuff. But if you do that for 50 years, you make a population that really doesn't know what these words mean. So I interpret those polls as being a very clear sign that millennials especially, but everybody in America, sees that this economic system, whatever its benefits, it's not helping me. It's hurting me. It, my kids can't go to school. They have debts that make them cry at night. The job prospects are really crappy. The government programs are being cut to ribbons. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to see that whatever this system is, it isn't working well. And that's what these polls show. This system is no longer uh, the greatest thing since sliced bread, the way it was made out to be. Well, there's, you know, you're, I remember as a kid, you're told we're the greatest country in the world, mm -hmm. we have the greatest economic mobility in the world, and it turns out that is no longer true, that there is greater economic mobility in Europe, right? right. And so that idea that if you come to the United States and you, anybody can work hard enough and make it, well, there's lots of people working three jobs right now, and I don't think they're making it. No. So that's a, so you you say that uh, the the pluses and minuses of capitalism. We know the minuses of capitalism. Uh, people are living it right now. Uh, Sixty three percent of Americans can't afford a thousand dollar emergency that's in right. the richest country in the world. Uh, Fifty percent of all wage earners earn thirty thousand dollars or less in the richest country in the world. Fifty percent of everyone in the United States is poor or low income. Right. That's a, what do you call a system that takes the richest country in the world and renders half of its population? I say you call that a failed system. And do you think we'll ever get to a place in America where we can actually have an honest conversation about this because our politicians are so afraid of it and they're so bought by the capitalists? I think they're going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming into that conversation, but I don't want to... I don't want to be impolite. I think you're doing it. I think I'm trying to do it. And I think there's more and more people like us that are, in fact, trying to have that conversation. And I am overjoyed to tell you 
that at least in my experience, and I know enough about how enthusiastic people are about your program, there's a lot of people that appreciate that, that this conversation is beginning to happen. And I just think we have to stay with it. We have to insist on it, and it'll spread like wildfire. And at a certain point, we're all going to be sitting here and saying to ourselves, my God, it's going so fast. It kind of have a new set of problems of what happens when an idea goes so quickly that kind of half-baked versions of it start sprouting up. But that's a good problem to have. I think we're on the way right now. I didn't think that three years ago, so it's not something I've always thought. Mm -hmm. I've always been very cautious and skeptical, but the last few years have, have really shifted me around as I see the response to what it is we're trying to do. Please make sure you subscribe. It only takes a second. Make sure you're subscribed and click that bell so they give you a notice whenever we drop a video. And if you can become a patron, we give you hours of bonus material every week. Our next live show is June 30th in Portland, Oregon. And we do a super solid chat every Saturday. That's our live stream. You can ask us questions and we answer back. That's Saturdays at 2 p.m. Pacific. Plus, we're on Steam It. We're steaming it right now. Mm -hmm.